Okay, so today, right into the content as always. I don't spend a lot of time asking for what does everybody else ask for? Subscribers, likes, notifications. I don't know, all that shit. I don't care about it, it's about the content as always. Getting these names out here uh, of missing persons and unsolved cases. That's what it's always about. So today we're going to talk about Kim Pandelios. She went missing this February 27th, 1992 out of California, Los Angeles to be exact. Uh, again, another case that I saw on Unsolved Mysteries and um, there was something about it that intrigued me, a, a teachable moment if you will. So that's why I wanted to do a quick video on this case. So Kim Pandelios was a 20 year old, not native Californian. She was, I believe, from Cuba and immigrated here when she was a child, but she lived in Pennsylvania for a while, which as you know is my home state. She attended Penn State University, which is, you know, half an hour from me. And I've been there numerous times growing up watching Penn State football. Uh, but more of her victimology. Very uh, attractive 20-year-old. Why she was at Penn State? She was at a bar. I'd like to know what bar it was because I think I've been to about every bar that's at Penn State University, especially in the early 90s. And she was there and she seen a band called Gandalf. Now, I heard of this band for some reason. And that struck me. Um, I'm, I might have even seen it up there at some point in time. But Kim fell in love with the drummer. And the drummer's name was Peter. She ended up marrying him and they moved from Pennsylvania to Florida. And then in November of 1991, they ended up moving to, you guessed it, California, LA. Maybe to try to get some modeling work for her, but maybe to try to enhance his music career. Now, I don't know which one was better off but it appears that by everything that we know Kim did follow through with some modeling and unfortunately that seemed to get her in a little bit of a predicament which it does with a lot the serial ki killer case that I've been working pro bono lately has such overtones to this case it's unbelievable and maybe that was another reason I wanted to do this, this case. There's so many cases to choose from, right? I thought about uh, Madeline McCann because everyone wants me to do that case. Uh, Brian Schaefer, I think, was another one. But to me, first off, I do what I want to do, okay? If something is, strikes me in a certain way, I'm going to do it. I never cave to peer pressure, ever. Never have, never will. I do what I want. But number two, famous cases, although some of them I enjoy. I, you know, I enjoy getting into them. But some of these unknown cases 
are very important and they're extremely important to the victim's families and as always that takes priority for me so on with Kim Pandelios we're going to jump forward to the timeline right to February 27th 1992 she had answered an ad for a modeling gig an outdoor shoot somewhere in the national forest outside of Los Angeles she was to meet an individual named Paul she had gone to this uh, hair salon she gotten uh, ready told people where she was going remember this was a time before cell phones so she leaves to meet Paul at one o'clock Around 2.30, Paul calls the house and talks to the babysitter, who's babysitting Kim's 13-month-old uh, uh, baby boy. He's calling to confirm that their appointment. Again, before cell phones, so this is important. She says, hey, she left to meet you. She's not here, blah, blah, blah. Around 7 o'clock that night, Paul calls again. And this time he says, hey, she was here, I met her, but she left her planner. Okay. Well, she had not arrived to pick up her son. She had not arrived for dinner. And this always seemed to be around 5 o'clock when she would be home. It's 7. It didn't happen. At 9.30 at night, her car is spotted on a, like a desolate back road to an entrance going into a campground. Nothing out of ordinary, but it's spotted, and it's spotted by a police officer. He takes note of it because, you know, a lone car up there, but he doesn't pay too much attention to it. Around 1.30, 1.40 a.m., so, you know, a few hours later, the car is spotted again by another police officer who's off duty on his way home. He's taking a shortcut, I guess, through that area, and it's on fire. And it's on fire in the passenger compartment. Now, what does that say? Well, a lot of times... That's a good indicator of arson. If you're just coming onto the scene and you're seeing things, uh, it's not the engine compartment, right? Fires can start elsewhere, but hey, you got to have your radar up. They run the plates. It comes back to you know Kim Pandelios, and they call the husband. He says he hasn't seen her uh, since earlier in the day when she left to meet for a photo shoot with this gentleman named Paul. Subsequently, they do a, and I don't know if this has to be just a cursory search of the area of where the car was, but they did find a handcuff key. Now, to me, you know, who's that reminiscent of? If you've watched my channel and watched my week-long series on Ted Bundy, uh, that is, that's what that reminded me of. Now, don't jump to the conclusion and say this is Ted Bundy. It's 1992. What do you do? Escape jail? Escape death penalty? Escape the electric chair? Go all the way to California? Kill somebody and come back? I wouldn't put a past Ted Bundy. But I digress. So, everything is called off at, that, at this point. You know, they do some search, try to do some follow-up, but the case goes cold. It's like she just disappeared in thin air, just like so many missing people. There's so many. I, I, I want you guys as like a little homework assignment. Get on uh, namus.com or the Doe Network and just do a cursory search of how many missing persons there are. It is mind-blowing and staggering amount. It's not on this level, but to me, like, I, a staggering amount is how fast 
the universe is, how many stars, and it's just so many that you can't even fathom it, you know, and missing persons, although not at that level, does make me cringe because how people can just disappear, this will be a fine case to show you how that happens though. So case goes cold until March of 93. So almost a year later, um, some people, some hikers are out in the woods, ironically around the same area of where her car was set on fire and they find human remains. Now I bring that up because it reminds me of the Mara Murray case and my I guess it's a theory, it's my opinion, that more than likely she was drunk and she wandered off and died of hypothermia or injuries from the wreck internally, whatever it was. I, I don't think she had enough injuries. But my point being is she could be in that area and people always say, well, she can't be in that area. They searched that area. Listen, folks, it's, right here is a prime example. They search an area and they find the remains years later. It can be missed all the time. So they find the remains. So now the case kind of heats back up. Um, and that is typical of cold cases. They will go in lulls and peaks. Okay, a lead will come in, everything's exciting, you know, we're following it through and it doesn't pan out, it goes back. This could be the same. You have a disappearance, you find a handcuff key, she's meeting a Paul, you're trying to figure out who Paul is. Then they find a couple of months later, her planner down over a bridge, things are scattered. Um, so you're up again, but then it doesn't pan out. Then you find her remains, okay, things are back up. And then sometimes they go back down. So. It is the ebb and flow, that's a Pearl Jam reference in case you don't know. I'm a hard rocker, but I like me some grunge too. Um, but it's the ebb and flow of cold case investigations. Speaking of hard rock, I gotta send a shout out, and I don't ever do shout outs, right? Can't believe I'm doing one, holy shit. I just said I didn't like subscriber counts and all that, but I'm doing a shout out. Yeah, well, this is for a metal man, uh, Mike Duda, who is a guitarist and vocalist. And if you don't know him, look him up. He sent me a autographed CD that he had just put out, and uh, it's great, and everyone should check it out. He sang with Cherie Curry of The Runaways. If you know anything about me, you know I love The Runaways. I love me some Cherie Curry and Joan Jett and Lita Ford and Sandy West. And anyhow, he did a duet with Cherie Curry, so there is that. Um, and I digress again. The even flow of cold case investigations is peaks and valleys all the time, highs and lows. Uh, I became gray that I am now, and through my investigation of Gail Tam uh, Matthews and Tamara Burkheiser, their murder that I worked on for 10 years. The peaks and valleys of that case, I would get so high that I think I'd have it solved, have the right evidence back to zero and then back up. And you know, my blood pressure is through the roof. I gotta take all these stupid medicines just to keep me even keel. And I think it's all because of that case. But I knew what I was getting into. So anyhow, find the remains. They find a black bra near it. They find pantyhose near the remains. And what this evidence, and they find, the hand, they find handcuffs. And those handcuffs match the key that was found near the car, okay? So, but one of the things that that evidence told me, it showed that the bra and the pantyhose were removed with a sharp object. They were cut, okay? Remember that. An individual named David Radmaker, 
becomes the focus of this investigation. When he gets out of, uh, I believe he got out of prison for having a relationship with a minor. It looked like a 15 year old girl, maybe 14. Um, in supplying her with heroin. He's convicted of that. He does time. He gets out. He starts talking to her and he makes some suggestions just like you guys hear that? Justice. That's my dog, Justice. Where are you? He's not going to show himself, but he's snoring. I guess I shouldn't have woke him. He starts making accusations to her, confessions of sort, um, you know, how he raped a girl that answered an ad of his in the forest. If she doesn't do what she's told, uh, she's going to end up like her. See how cool case investigations, I tell people, oftentimes are easier. Sometimes they're harder in some aspects, but sometimes they're easier than the active homicide investigators have it. Because we have the luxury of time. And time can be bad when it comes to evidence, certainly. Things de degrade and de deteriorate, but so do relationships. And that helps the cold case investigator, just like here. So this girl who is no longer with him, police reach back out to her, which is always a smart move. Go back. Usually they're scorned. Sometimes they've been holding a lot of things in and they want to get it out. In this case, she did. She told him what he had said about raping the girl in the forest and the model. And they interviewed another girlfriend of his. Who? Guess what? She was a minor as well at the time that they were dating. And she says, I've been waiting for you guys to contact me. See, that is always key. They don't want to come to you. They won't. But when you go to them, they'll talk. And this is a case where it absolutely tied this together. Because what happened is this girlfriend says, you know what? Late one night, he told me he had a fantasy about burning cars. So we drove out to this area along a national forest road where there was a campground close by. And I watched him burn this car. Well, guess whose car it was? That's right. Kim Pandelius. And guess when that date was? February 27th, going into the 28th of 1992. That ties him to the case, okay, if nothing else. So please do the smart thing. They consensualize her. Now what's that? I believe California is a two-party state, which means you, it is a, yeah, I know it is, because I researched it, because on the hunt for the Zodiac show, they wanted me to wear a wire to go in and talk to Bose Hamilton about some codes and not let them know that I was recording. And I said, absolutely not. That's against the law. At least in Pennsylvania, I've done many wiretap cases. I understand it's a two-party state, which means you have to have uh, consent from both parties. Well, if you have a court order, it becomes a one-party state and you don't have to tell the other person. And that's what they did here. They consensualized her. And she began recording conversations with David Rademacher. He admits in these conversations not to killing her, not to raping her, but setting the car on fire. Does that move the case forward at all? And why does he admit to that and not anything else? Well, he could have certainly just had a fantasy and found that car and burned it. It could be completely coincidental, right? I would buy that. Okay. They found it. She 
became harmed by somebody else. Not David. But then you got to dig a little deeper. And police do. And they find that he his phone records showed up on Kim's phone records. Now, now you have something. Before you didn't, okay? Now you do. Now you have a connection. Now there is no coincidence. Now it's not, hey, you know what? Yes, I know her, and she was going to do some modeling for me, um, and I just happened to find her car out of all the whole state of California to set fire. No. No. So he admits to this on tape. Now, why does he admit to it? Well, because she was there. He has to admit to that. Okay? If she wasn't there, he would have never admitted to it. Just like he's not admitting to killing her. But he's arrested in 2004. And all this goes to trial. And the two uh, juveniles at the time testify against him. All, the, all of this ties back to David Rademacher. With the exception of one little thing. This is the reason I wanted to do this case. Because it's a teachable moment. In all true crime, one of the biggest hiccups, if you will, is identification. Witness identifications. Now, how does that play into this? Well, I'm going to explain it to you. Remember when I said she went missing on Thursday, February 27, 1992? That's a Thursday. On Saturday, there's a guy, an off-road guy, out driving around in his car, out in all these back roads in the National Forest, and he comes to this campground, which ironically is right near where her car was found. He goes back this road. He stops in the middle of this campground. And he looks over and he sees this beautiful girl. Her, he says her hair is all done up. She's dressed to the nines. Out of place for being in the campground and she looks sad and she looks up at him doesn't say anything and she's just looking at him and he noticed something's you know not right and then all of a sudden three guys with long hair hell's angels tattoos like me jump out right they jump out and they surround his car what are you looking at what's your problem uh he takes off. He's like, oh my God, I don't know what I just got into, but uh, I'm not happy about it and I'm not staying around here. So he leaves. Well, a couple days later, they're watching on the, I think it was a year later after they found the remains and they identified the remains through the dental records to Kim Pandelius. They show her a picture on the, all the news. This guy says, that's the girl. That's absolutely the girl. 100%. I saw her two days after she went missing, right near where her car was. I'm positive. So positive that it goes on Unsolved Mysteries. And they make a big scene about it. She was kidnapped by three bikers. Or unsavory characters. You can't say bikers. There was a panel van there, not bikes. But they look like bikers. But so do I, I guess. And I'm not a biker. But my point is, they were. he was wrong. He was wrong. Did he see somebody? Probably. Did he convince himself that it was Kim? It just goes to show that eyewitness testimony cannot, for the most part, be trusted. To me, it's 50-50. You know, you, you want to believe people. 
because you don't feel that they're making it up, but they can be mistaken. I'll give you another perfect example. Before I was a cop, this is like in 2002, I'm working as, my dad owned the electronic business. He fixed VCRs, televisions, and I was working there. Guy brought in a stool and a VCR. I looked at it, he wanted to sell it. He wanted to pawn it, because sometimes we sold uh, used equipment. I didn't buy it. Uh, and I don't know why I didn't buy it. I didn't. I don't know if I felt something was wrong. Regardless, I didn't buy it. But I had a good 10-minute conversation with the guy. Not even the next day. I'm talking hours later. Police come in. And they said, hey, did somebody come in here and try to sell a visa? Yep. You think you could pick them out of a lineup? Yep. You sure? No doubt. You know why? I had a 10-minute conversation with them two hours ago. Came in with a photo lineup. I said, that's him. No. Twice. I missed it. He was in there, but I missed it. So, what I'm saying is, eyewitness identification. Yeah. It's a touchy, touchy subject, okay? David Rademacher is arrested and he's convicted of kidnapping and first degree murder. What did he do is he lured this girl out there and when you look at his suspectology okay what's in his background well he seemed to be infatuated with teenagers not just because of the two previous girlfriends that testified there was probably more he ran some sort of teenage chat before internet it was telephone you would call give numbers this and that you could get a code young girls would get hooked on that and then he would suspend their code, and they, he would make them meet him to get the code back. Now, you know how many sexual assaults were probably done then that was not reported? Hundreds, I bet you. But this guy, he confessed to at least one girl. One girl witnessed him burning her car. Did he do it? Yes. He's guilty of it. Um... The defense wanted to, at trial, bring in the, the outlaw bikers and the eyewitness testimony. And I think the state proved that he was mistaken. Now, I want to get back to the black bra and the pantyhose that was found that were cut. Now, David had made mention to this one of his young girlfriends that he drowned her he drowned Kim when she refused his advances. Because there was a creek bed nearby. Now, I do I believe that that's the case? Yes. But what made me question it was the bra and the pantyhose being cut off of her. Because if you have a knife, why not use a knife as your instrument of death? Many reasons. Could have been knocked out of his hands during a struggle. The state believes that she was probably handcuffed. Um, and, I, and I would probably tend to agree with that. But then the introduction to a knife. Why, why have a knife if you have handcuffs? I'll tell you why. Initially, I thought for control. You always got to have something. You can't just show up and not have a weapon if you're intending to rape and kill somebody. Uh, so maybe he didn't have access to a gun, but he did have a knife. He uses the knife to gain control of her initially, right? Uh, and to get the cuffs on. Once the cuffs are on and he transports her, see, he took her away from where the car was, uh, I want to say maybe a, a quarter mile at least to a place that's called the cement slab where he, where he killed her. Why, why take her back there? Why not kill her right there next to her car? Well, that's obvious. He wants, he wants privacy. 
He wants to be away from everybody. So he can do his dastardly deed. Now, so when he gets back there, she's already handcuffed. You know, he handcuffs her, takes her back there. Uh, now, I'm not sure if she was driven back there, if he had his car, which was uh, a 4x4, four four, back there, or he walked her back there. I believe she was wearing high heels, so she certainly would have taken those heels off. And I'd be curious to know if they were found. Because if they weren't found, uh, maybe he walked her to that location and disposed of her shoes, you know, along that trail. Because it doesn't seem, although they did find some items, it doesn't seem like it was searched extremely well. But I shouldn't say that because I don't know. But you use the knife. So now she's handcuffed. Why cut the bra and pantyhose when she's handcuffed? You could, you could take both off fairly easily. But then you don't have the element of fear. And as you know, when an assault like this is occurring, the reason it is, is mostly with the power. You get off on the power. I shouldn't say you get off, because I don't, and I'm sure you don't. They do. So the fear factor comes in a little bit with the knife. And it is used to cut off the brawl. And I think it's used to make her comply even more. Now according to David, he had said that she was begging. She wouldn't, wouldn't tell anybody. That she would just wanted to go home to see her kid. And uh, she wouldn't tell anybody. That's that's tough to hear. It's always tough to hear someone's last words and things um, and what people say. You know, some people like Sharon Tate wanting her mommy. Just stuff like that. That bothers me. And then you have you know dick slaps like Wesley Sherman time. You ever hear of that killer? Him and Lorenzo something. They're speed freak killers. He killed this girl named Chevy. Uh, and he cut her throat and laid there beside her and told her let it come naturally. Like that sticks with me. Stuff like that. So. When anthropologists... Uh, were excavating the site and stuff and they found her remains. One of the things that they noticed is that she had a fractured mandible. So she had a fractured jaw. If she, it, 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 uh, to me, yes, that could be very consistent with drowning. Um, you have the back of somebody's head and you're pretty much slamming it into a creek bed. Um, I think you could get a fractured jaw that way. But it's also indicative of maybe a lot of things. He could have hit her with a stick, a rock, his fists. Um, but him saying that he drowned her, do I believe that? Yes, I do. But, you know, my first inclination was if the brawl was cut and the pantyhose was cut, why didn't he just stab her? Um, but as I said, there's many reasons of why maybe that did not happen. So... So that, that's the story of Kim Pandalois. Pandilo, Pandali, Pandalias? Pandalois. Uh, she, it's unfortunate. She definitely, definitely went out of this life just like so many other victims do in such a horrendous way. And I just, I always say, listen, everybody has the ability to kill. I used to say everybody has the propensity to kill. And I don't know if propensity is the right word. But you have the ability, not just physically, but mentally, to kill somebody. You just do. 
it's just the circumstances are different. Somebody's in war, they've killed. Somebody is caught red-handed molesting your child. You could kill them. Uh, just different circumstances. But predators, uh, serial killers that get off on murder, that's a whole different section. And this guy, I, I would be surprised to know that this was his only kill. Because why did he kill her? <clears throat> because she refused his advances? Come on now. I don't buy that. I bet you there was hundreds of girls that refused his advances. And probably some of them he took. The others got away or whatever it was. But just because she refused doesn't mean that that's the reason. That's the motive to kill her. So I would be shocked to find out, or I would not be shocked to find out that he had other murders under his belt. Could that have been his first one? You know, there's progressions. The serial killer that I'm working on now progressed for many years. I'm talking maybe even a decade of rapes before it progressed to killing. But it didn't progress because of the, the feelings that he had. It progressed because he got in trouble by one of the rape victims. So now it is, hey, you know, I'm already doing this. I'm already committing a crime. I'm not going to let any of the other ones live. So to him, it was just like trash. And he didn't get off any more by killing them than he did raping them. But there's other people that get off sexually by the physical act of murder. I don't know what this guy is. Could it have been his first murder and only murder? Yes. Hopefully, um, because if he wasn't caught, he probably would have done it again. But you have a year time gap, right? From February 27, 92, when he killed Kimberly, until he was arrested in 2004. That's a big gap. You're telling me he didn't do any other murders, any other sexual assaults within that time frame. I find that hard to believe. So I would be looking, if I was investigators, at some other cases where this happened. Uh, because, because there's two there's two reasons. He either did it because he enjoyed it, he enjoyed the the thrill of the kill and it it, it sexually aroused him, or he did it because he wasn't going to allow a victim to get him in trouble. So then you would have to say, well, he must have laid dormant for 12 years. Ah, I just, one of those two things would have occurred within those 12 years. So, I don't know. Justice! What are you snoring for? It's the middle of the day. I wish I could. I wish you would make an appearance, and I would show you my beloved yellow lab justice. But he's too busy snoring on a nice sunny day. But then again, I'm inside on a nice sunny day doing this video for you because it's important. I can go out and get some sun and do some yard work here in a little bit. But I want to go over my notes now. Make sure I didn't miss anything because it's very important. We talked about the victimology. The victimology, I didn't really get into too much here other than she was an immigrant and then she went to Penn State because it was close to me. But other than her just being a super, super sweet girl, everybody says that, okay? So other than that, fight or flight, that's one of the things I'd like to know. It's important to know whether they would succumb to somebody's advances. There was talk at the trial by the defense, but again, listen, the, the defense, they got a job to do. I understand that. But 90% of the defense that I've ever worked with in my 20 year career have been scummy worms 
who will bring up things that have no bearing and can be hurtful for the victim, the victim's families, in order to get their client off. Listen, I get it. You got a job to do. But I don't have to appreciate the way you go about doing it. And in this case, they talked about her being a prostitute. That she was working in David's prostitution ring. I didn't see any evidence of that when I looked at this. Um, and the reason they brought that up is because David allegedly said to his girlfriend that she worked as a prostitute in his prostitution ring. They had sex. And then she went off for another appointment. Another client. And so the defense brought that up. Listen, I, I would be hard pressed to say I don't respect defense attorneys. There's some defense attorneys that I have a lot of respect for. Nicole Spring, I had done. She worked there for uh, the courthouse where I was at for 35 years. Ton of respect for her. Um, Eric Linhart, who was my district attorney, but before that, he was he and he was my right hand man. I mean, me and him were are tight. We still are. But before that, he was a defense attorney, and I went against him in court and I had respect for him even though I didn't like him I had respect for him uh, Gina Longo is another one that I had respect for her, even though at one point in trial she called me a professional liar because I was undercover and she says well you lie all the time don't you yes I do well then we could classify you as a professional liar blah 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 I still won the case at trial and out in the hallway she said she was sorry but that's all she had but again that's what defense does she knows that I'm not a liar in real life. Yeah, as pretend as an undercover cop, you know, I did lie about things. But I never lie in the real life. <laughs> it's so funny that you talk real life and fake life, but that's, you know, I worked undercover for oh, half of my career, almost 10 years I was undercover, so... Anyhow, don't get me started on defense attorneys. Uh, Jose Baez, I mean, scum. Scummy, some of the things he did. hate to say he's scum because I never met the guy. I just go off of some things that I've seen or hear, and I try not to do that too much. Um, there's 20 other defense attorneys I could name around here, and some of them I like and some of them I don't. So, anyhow. Sorry I digressed on that. I'm going over the notes. I talked about the victimology, the timeline. Uh, the most important thing was that Brad Leon said he saw her kind of at this campsite with three biker type guys. And he was wrong. Um, the evidence, the handcuff key, the appointment book being thrown out over a bridge, brawl and pantyhose cut, the fractured mandible. Oh, and this was important. I didn't bring this up. And this is this goes back to me believing that he has other victims. is because he went back to the crime scene. Think about that. Ted Bundy would tell us that. He would say, because he did it. And he said that about the Green River Killer. He'll go back to the scene of the crime. And that's what this guy did. He was with his underage girlfriend. And they went back to the area. And David found her remains. They were still there. And he found a leg bone. And he supposedly took it and got rid of it. Um, I can't say that that's 100% indicative of a serial killer or anything like that um, because in one of my cases this case here I'm sorry about the glare that's on these I'm gonna have to try to fix that but so this was front page of the paper when I solved um, a 20 year old missing person case and that individual went back to the crime scene as well on more than one occasion and I don't believe that he was a serial killer um, but he did go back. And I don't know whether... Well, he went back once to remove the body or, or to, to move it. 
but he went back at other times too and I'm not sure if it was to masturbate at the crime scene or what or what but there are similarities in that case and this of them going back to the scene and it could just be because of curiosity but it's a risk right but after a few years you think you're okay nobody's gonna know um, so it could be a sexual component to revisiting these scenes but it could just be a curiosity thing too and it seems to me maybe that's what this was <clears throat> not so sure about dickhead that killed her uh, I talked about recording the phone calls admitting to the fire not the murder of course he's going to do that and he's currently in jail well that's it okay that's um, that's all I got for the Kim Pendelios story I thought it was important to get this out there um, first and foremost as always, my condolences to her family and her friends and her son. It's just a shame. People were so selfish and sexual desire is so overwhelming and powerful that these, most of the time, 95% of the time, females are victimized. Um... It's a shame. It really is. That beauty can be a downfall to somebody. There's so many pluses in society with beauty and being good looking and all those things, but there's some risk to it too. Just like hitchhiking was a lot of benefits to it in the 70s. Well, we've come to learn there was a lot of downfall to hitchhiking as well, right? And we do not see it much at all anymore. So, that's it. Um, what do I got going on? Uh, I have some big news. A lot of big news coming up, I think. The serial killer case that I'm working on is going to be uh, pretty big news. I'm also working with a family member of a very very famous case and I will be traveling within the next month or two uh, to the location of the crime scene and trying to help this family member who deserves it in this very very high profile case um yeah so i'm looking forward to that i want to help this lady out and uh, i want to help the families from this serial killer out as well and there's going to be some big news on the horizon for that sorry i can't give you details it's just things that uh i i don't do i can't do when i can i will put it that way so that's it Eddie, uh, hey, you guys know this shirt? Eddie Wilson, Eddie and the Cruisers, Eddie Lives, part two. Music, baby. Gotta listen to it. Gotta love it. Guns N' Roses, Metallica, CCR, Leonard Skinner, The Doors. Just listen to it. Pink Floyd, let it make you happy. Uh, the CD that Mike Duda sent me. The Runaways, Sherry Curry, Joan Jett. All them. Motley Crue. I could go on and on. Listen to music. It makes you happier. So with that said, hey, till next time, strong salute. Mains out.